Well, um, good evening, everybody. Everybody that's here, um, welcome and thank you for being here uh, to our Christmas Eve service. Those of you watching, listening, who weren't able to make it out or who feel safer being home, that's completely okay, that's fine. I really hope that you will enjoy this message, that you will be blessed. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we want to pray with you. We want to bless you. So let us know how we can do that. As many of you know, that a lot of these Christmas songs, a lot of these worship Christmas songs, they have a lot of meaning. They have a lot of depth. They speak a lot about hope, love, joy, peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Out of all those uh, aspects that I mentioned, love, joy, hope, and peace that God has given us uh, when his child, when his son was born. Tonight I'm going to be concentrating on just two of those aspects, hope and peace. So before I read to you God's word, let's pray and ask him to bless this evening. Lord God, thank you again. A great time of worship. Um, Pray that you will bless this message, Lord. May it go out there online. May it bless those that are listening. May may lives be changed uh, on this Christmas Eve. Lord, may they see their need for you, their need for a Savior, their need for an everlasting, eternal hope and peace. Thank you for sending Jesus to us. Thank you for sending him in the form of us, Lord, human being, so that he can relate to us and we can relate to him, Lord. So bless this evening, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so for the next few minutes, for the first half here, I want to concentrate on how Jesus, that child in that manger, is a child of hope. So I'm going to leave it up to you, but I'm going to be reading just a couple verses from... Uh, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Okay, so Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to be reading from verses 4 through 6. And the Word of God says, When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. As I mentioned, tomorrow morning, millions of Americans will be celebrating Christmas. For many of them, though, the focus of this season means nothing more than parties, gifts, decorations, and time off of work. But for Christians, for born-again believers, however, this time of year is a happy reminder of the hope we have because of Jesus Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, and then, just when everything is bearing down on us, to such an extent that we can scarcely withstand it, the Christmas message comes to tell us that all our ideas, all our ideas are wrong, and that what we take to be evil and dark is really good and light because it comes from God. Our eyes are at fault. That is all. God is in the manger, wealth in poverty, light in darkness. Succor, succor in abandonment. No evil can befall us. Whatever men may do to us, they cannot but 
they could not but serve the God who is secretly revealed as love and rules the world and our lives, unquote. Christ means hope. To the person out of work, to the struggling single mother, to the dying believer, even at the various difficulties and disappointments you've been through this year has pushed you to your limits, if you feel like you're barely crawling to the end of this year, to the finish line, to the end of this year, you know that because you have Jesus, there is hope. Now, not the kind of fairy tale hope where we wish for a happy ending, but the kind of hope that is solid and real. Billy Graham said, the very purpose of Christ's coming into the world was that he might offer up his life and sacrifice for the sins of men. He came to die. This is the heart of Christmas. Now the Lexham Bible Dictionary defines hope as the confidence that by integrating God's redemptive acts in the past with trusting human experiences in the present, the faithful will experience the fullness of God's goodness both in the present and in the future. In Romans chapter 8, verses 23 to 25, Paul described what our hope is and what it accomplishes. We groan within ourselves, eagerly, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do see, now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Now in the main passage we read from in Galatians chapter 4, Paul elaborates further on this hope that we have. The expression, the time came to completion, refers to that time when the world was providentially ready for the birth of the Savior. Historians tell us that at the time, at that time, the Roman world was in great expectation, waiting for a deliverer, waiting for Jesus to be born, for the Messiah. You see, the old religions were dying. The old prophecies were empty and powerless to change men's lives. It was also a time of religious bankruptcy that was causing severe spiritual famine everywhere. God, however, was preparing the world for the arrival of his son. And roughly 2,000 years ago, the wait was over. So you see, Christ's birth at Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, wasn't an accident. It was divine. It was a divine appointment. God sent his son out of heaven and to earth on a mission. Yet the child that was born, whose birth we're celebrating, wasn't only God's son, but he was also born like you and me, born of a woman. And then as, and as an Israelite, he was born under the law in order that he might magnify it in his life and bear its curse in his death. Now in verse 5, he gives us two reasons, that two reasons God sent his son. First, he came to redeem those under the law, meaning he meaning to set set free by paying a price. And this isn't a redemption from the curse of the law, but from a slavery to the entire mosaic system, all of it. So the emphasis isn't on the penalty of the law, but on its bondage. Second, 
Christ's incarnation and death secured believers the adoption as sons. This means that all the enjoyments and privileges of a natural born son now belong to those who have been adopted into that family because of Christ's redemptive work. Under law, the Jews were mere children. But under grace, the believer is a son of God with the adult standing, with adult standing in God's family. Now, I want you to keep in mind, if you're a Christian, you receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Let me add that too. You don't recover it. In this sense, this means that you gain something in Jesus that is greater than what Adam ever had. You see, Adam was never adopted as a son of God in the way believers are. So what? So we are mistaken when we think of redemption as merely restoration of what was lost with Adam. We are granted more in Jesus than Adam ever had. John Newton, the man who wrote the most popular, famous hymn in America, Amazing Grace, knew how to remember this. He was an only child whose mother died when he was only seven years old. He became a sailor and went out to sea at 11 years old. As he grew up, he became the captain of a slave ship and had an active hand in the horrible degradation and inhumanity of the slave trade. But when he was 23, on March 10th, 1748, when his ship was in imminent danger of sinking off the coast of Newfoundland, he cried out to God for mercy, and he found it. He never forgot how amazing it was that God had received him, as bad as he was. To keep it fresh in his memory, he fastened across the wall over the fireplace mantle of his study the words of Deuteronomy, Chapter 15, verse 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. If you keep this fresh in your mind, if you keep who you once were fresh on your mind, and what you are now in Jesus, you will do well. Paul then goes on, goes on to say that God the Father not only sent his Son, he also sent the Spirit of his Son. Thus, the full Trinity is involved in the work of salvation. The Holy Spirit is a gift of God to every believer who has been redeemed and has become a son or daughter. This ought to tell you that when you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, then, as a son or daughter, his spirit is in you. Now, how do we know this? Well, we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. So your spirit and his spirit testifies. They just know, yeah, we're God's children. There's no doubt about it. Furthermore, he's present within each believer's heart to give evidence of one's position in God's family. It's his spirit that moves the believer to pray to God, addressing him as Abba Father. Now, the word Abba is the Aramaic, Aramaic word for father. However, the way it's expressed here is very informal. It's, an inf it's informal in, in, in the way that's used by small children that is pretty, it's almost the same or similar to the word we use, daddy. This word also indicates intimacy and trust as opposed to the formalism of legalism. Thus, we have access 
to the same intimacy with God that God's Son, Jesus Christ, had. We get a glimpse of that intimacy that Jesus had with God the Father in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. When our Lord said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. So, ladies and gentlemen, what does this tell us? Tells us what does this tell us about hope? Hope has to do with trust and confidence. It's the resting. It's resting. It's the resting of the human heart on God, with a, with full trust that He will care for us and our salvation, and will give us the happiness He promised. It's an eager expectation and anticipation of what is sure to come. An active faith, an active faith-infused waiting for God to fulfill that which he started by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is trust. Hope is joy. Hope is peace. Hope gives us courage and strength. As we wrap the year 2020 up, many of us have felt hopeless and fearful. We have all lived through a pandemic, riots, stock market crashes, wildfires, ice storms, job losses, and a still unknown presidential election. On top of that, you may have loved one who, you may have a loved one who's addicted to drugs or alcohol. You may not know where they are, wonder if they'll ever find recovery or if they'll relapse. So as you can see, we are overwhelmed by the chaos around us. However, I also want you to try to imagine the chaos that was going around Jesus' birth 2,000 years ago in a small town in Bethlehem. It was everything but silent. It wasn't a silent night. Nevertheless, hope was found that night. Many times we put all our hope on in our spouse, child, parent, friend, co-worker, and we're continually let down by them. That's you. If you've been continually let down by the people you care about the most, by one person or another, or maybe a bunch of people, then I want to encourage you to shift that hope to the hope of Christ. Cling to the hope of the birth of Jesus. Someone once said, the birth of the child Jesus in a desolate village at the margins of the Roman Empire, the fragile beginnings of our, um, are the fragile beginnings of our own redemption. As people of hope, we glimpse in the birth of Jesus, God's yes to life, and the birth of a new possibility, new life triumphing over, triumphing over death and despair in a world of pain and death. The event of Christmas allows us to find consolation, lift our heads in hope, and glimpse in deep faith the triumph of life and love in the birth of Jesus. This is good news of great joy for all people, unquote. Friends, God wants us to live with hope and assurance that all his promises will come true for us, that and that our future is firmly and safely secure in his hand for our good. Christmas is renewal of hope, is a renewal of hope. It reconfirms for us if our vision has grown dim. 
it was settled long ago. So we don't have to doubt anymore. Jesus is the fulfillment of our hope. Of our, hope. our deepest longings come true. Dr. Tony Evans said, We have lasting hope through the salvation we have in Christ. Hope means that even when it looks like it's all over, it's not all over yet. That's why the Bible says we can rejoice even in our tribulations. God is working in our hand in our in our hard times to produce proven character and hope in us. Unquote. So now that we've seen how the baby wrapped tightly in a cloth and laid in a manger offers us hope. I now want to share with you how he offers us peace. For that, I'll be in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And again, I'll just be reading a couple of verses. Or maybe it's just one verse. Luke chapter 2. Now, I did a full study on this. I think it was a year and a half ago. Find that on our website or actually on YouTube, also on SoundCloud and our um I, I uh, Apple podcast as well. So I'll just cover a few points about that. So Luke chapter 2. And I'll be in verse 13. Luke chapter 2, verse 13. And there it says, Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people he favors. These two verses tell us that upon the Savior's birth, our Savior's birth, an angelic chorus burst on the scene and that the first persons to hear the good news were shepherds. Why shepherds? Why not priests and scribes? You see, by visiting shepherds, the angel revealed the grace of God towards mankind. Shepherds, especially those charged with the night watch, were among the most socially undesirable classes. They were considered disreputable and unclean. And they represented the outcasts and sinners for whom Jesus came. Their work not only made them ceremonially unclean, but it kept them away from the temple for weeks at a time so that they couldn't be made clean. This confirms what Paul tells us, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many of you, not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. Well, the angels song known generally today by the title that or by a song that we commonly sing during christmas time gloria or glory in excelsis deo catches up or catches up the full significance of the birth of the baby essentially that his life and ministry would bring glory to god in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people he favors. So who are these people? Who are these people that God favors? 
a people God favors are those who repent of their sins and have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who have been born again, been regenerated. Ladies and gentlemen, those that are here watching and listening, my great desire for all of you this Christmas is that you enjoy his peace. Now, we know that there are global aspects to this peace that lie in the future when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and the waters cover the sea. We covered this when we went through the book of Habakkuk. But Jesus has come to inaugurate that peace among people. He came to do that. And there are three relationships in which he wants you to pursue this peace and enjoy this peace. Peace with God, peace with your own soul, and peace with other people as much as it lies in you. So let's quickly look at each of these three peaceful relationships briefly and make sure that you are enjoying it as much as you can. The key to each of them is not to separate what the angels kept together, the glory of God and the peace you long for. First of all, peace with God. The most basic need we have is peace with God. This is foundational to all of our pursuits of peace. If we don't go here first, all other experiences of peace will be superficial and temporary. The key passage here is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified means that God declares you to be just in his sight by imputing to you the righteousness of Jesus. That means that Jesus' righteousness has been placed upon you. You have his righteousness now. And he does that by faith alone. Not by works, not by tradition, not by baptism, not by church membership, not by piety, not by parentage, but by faith alone. When we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, as a Savior, I'm sorry, when we believe in Jesus as a Savior and the Lord and the supreme treasure of our lives, we are united with him and his righteousness is counted by God as ours. We are justified by faith and as a result, we have peace. We don't need to be afraid anymore. Second, peace with ourselves. Since we have peace with God because of being justified by faith, we can begin to grow in the enjoyment of peace with ourselves. And here I include any sense of guilt or anxiety that tends to paralyze us and makes us hopeless. Don't limit the peace of God by what your understanding can see. He gives us inexplicable peace, super rational peace. And when he does, and when it does, and when he does it, and when he does it, when he takes our anxieties, when we take our anxieties to him in prayer and trust him, we know that he will carry them for us and he will protect us. When we do this, when we come to him and trust him as our loving and almighty heavenly father to help us, his peace comes to us and it steadies us and it protects us from the disabling effects of fear and anxiety 
and guilt. So do that this Christmas. Take your anxieties to God. Tell him about it. Ask him to help you, to protect you, to restore your peace. And then use, and then to use you to make peace. So here we come to the third. God wants us to pursue peace with others. This one we have least control over. So we need to say it carefully when Paul, we need to say it carefully the way Paul does in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, where he says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. For many of you, when you get together with family for Christmas, there will be some awkward and painful relationships. And you may know what I'm talking about or who I'm talking about. Some of the pain is very old, and some of it is new. In some relationships, you know what you have to do, no matter how hard it is. And in some of them, you are baffled and don't know what the path of peace calls for. In both cases, the key is trusting the promises of God with heartfelt awareness of how he forgave you through Christ. Continually cultivate a sense of amazement that in spite of all your sins, God has forgiven you through Christ. Be amazed that you have peace with God in this, in this sense of amazement that I, a sinner, have peace with God. That makes the heart tender, kind, and forgiving. So extend this to others 70 times 7. It may be thrown back to you in your face. It certainly was. It certainly was thrown back to Jesus' face on the cross. Yes, that hurts. And it can make you feel bitter if you're not careful. Don't let it. Keep being more amazed that your wrongs are forgiven and that you keep being more amazed that your wrongs are forgiven than that you than than that you are wronged. Be amazed that you have peace with God. You have peace with your soul. Your guilt is taken away. Keep trusting God. And then you will be like, like, like the angels. Glory to God in the highest is the first thing. Peace among his people is the second thing. So as I begin to close, let me again remind you of the three reasons, or three reasons why the birth of Jesus leads to, birth, to hope and peace. Reason one, at Christmas, Jesus came to end all suffering. God sees all the problems of the world, including yours, and he has promised ultimately to fix them. To do this, he sent Jesus to carry out a plan to end all suffering. At Christmas, we celebrate Christ's entrance into the world to do that. Because of what Jesus came to do, the Bible tells us this in Revelation chapter 20, 21, verses 3 to 5. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. So, ladies and gentlemen, one day, there will be no more disease, no more tragedy, no more suffering, no more death, no more heartache. That's a reason for hope and celebration. Reason number two, 
at Christmas, Jesus came to bring peace to believers. In John 14, 27, Jesus has promised peace to believers. And there he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I, didn't, I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul wrote of God's peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So you see, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, came to provide the way for sinful people to have peace with God. He gives believers the resources to be at peace with him, experience inner peace, and helps them become the kind of people they can live, that can live in peace with others. However, as Jesus suffered persecution, so will his followers. So will we. Yet, even during those times, even when the entire world seems to be going against you, when you're being hated and persecuted just because you love Jesus, during those times, you can experience the peace of God. That child in that manger came to bring us peace. Reason number three. At Christmas, the child of hope and peace now makes his gift of hope and peace available to you. Just as Christmas, just as a Christmas present only becomes yours when you receive it, when you actually say, thank you, I'll take that gift. The gifts of forgiveness and a new life in Christ Jesus only become yours if you receive him by faith. God offers you this gift of a relationship with him, a relationship that allows you to experience the healing and comfort that you desperately need, and a relationship that guarantees an eternity spent with him in the perfect, tear-free reality that he is design designing for you. You may have worries that you don't deserve to be forgiven by God, that your sin is too terrible, too horrible, too awful, too bad. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. His love goes beyond anything you've ever experienced. He loves you without conditions. And if you enter into relationship with him, he accepts you because of what Christ did for you, not because of anything you've done or will ever do. As the Bible says in Titus 3.5, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it says, For you have been saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift. It is a gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So this Christmas Eve, as I start to really close down this message, before you head off to bed, before you start wrapping the presents and watching your favorite movie and sitting with a loved one watching your favorite Christmas movie, maybe wondering how do I receive this gift? How do I receive this gift that Jesus has offered me or that God has offered me through his son? Maybe you've never seen Jesus in that way when you saw that, when you see those nativity scenes of a little baby laying in a feeding trough and 
inside of a manger. But now you see that he is a child of hope and peace and that he can give that to you. He's offering that gift to you. So how do you receive this amazing gift? Well, first, you admit that you're a sinner who needs to have a relationship with God. Secondly, believe that Jesus died in your place, paying your sin debt, and be willing to allow God to make you obedient to him. That's all there is to it. If you believe those two things and are willing to obey God, God's leading in your life, that sin barrier is gone. You have a relationship with him. Now, if you've done that, if you have have a relationship, if you've been born again and, and you feel like you're walking obediently with him, you take a moment to thank God for allowing you to have a relationship with him and beginning the process of changing your life. If not, then let me allow, let me lead you to the cross, to the cross of Jesus so that he may forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future sins, and give you the hope and peace you've been searching for and longing for all your life. Don't let the year, a new year start without receiving him, without a new life in him. When you receive him, when he comes to live within you, he starts to change, radically change you. And as you walk in obedience, as you listen and pray and read his word and study and, yes, come to church, fellowship with believers, your life begins to change. Your perspective changes. You're no longer longing for the things of the world. All you want is the things of God, and you want to serve your fellow believer. You want to love others. You no longer live in fear. You no longer are worried about life or death or COVID. The Lord will speak to you hard and give you the peace that you need. And all that because of Jesus, because God sent his son on that Christmas night 2,000 years ago. So if you're ready, if you're watching, listening, <coughs> and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ this Christmas Eve, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And even if you're listening to this and through some headphones and you're with a group of people, find a, a quiet, solitary place and just, you can get on, on your knees and pray this with the bottom of your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I now ask you that you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen.
If you prayed that, reach out to us. We want to hear all about it and help you on your next steps, new steps as a Christian. If you need a Bible, we'll send one to you. If you need a, if you're out of town or different state, different country, call us, reach out to us. We'll help you find a church wherever you may be. If you're in town, and I want you to, if you're in El Paso, I want to invite you to come check out our church here in Northeast El Paso. Sit, you know, here for a few weeks. We're not going to ask anything of you. We're just going to welcome you and maybe give you a smile and just tell you that you're loved. Make you feel loved. So, again, if you're here in town, we invite you to we actually, like I said, we're going to have service, Sunday service, in a few days, so maybe you can come check us out then. Thank you for joining us this Christmas Eve. I know that many of you have, probably have a lot left to do, and I hope that you get it all accomplished, but during that time, think about these things that were mentioned. Think about the hope and peace we have in, you have in Christ. Hold on to it. I hope that you will enjoy uh, tomorrow with your family. And uh, we hope to see you soon here at Fresh Vision Church. Goodbye and farewell. <laughs>